concepts, which underline it three a new and different approaches to environmental law and conflict resolution with new and transformative paradigms. These three approaches acknowledge that the, that the kind of environmental law that currently exists is incapable of truly addressing the ecological crisis of our day. And both present the fundament and, and the three of them present the fundamental ecocentric rethinking of environmental law. However, they, are, they have different advan advantages and limitations and different histories in terms of how they have been uh, uh, so far applied. Uh, Ecocide is a recognition that is an, a living entity, the killing, uh, maiming or destruction of nature and the beings are composed, uh, that compose is, uh, must be a crime under the relevant penal code. Uh, rights of nature is a recognition that, the, that uh, nature is a living entity and that it has inalienable rights, interests and responsibilities just like any human being. Uh, and, and thus it needs a representation in, in the court of law. Restorative justice focuses on addressing the harm caused by crime while holding the offender responsible for actions by providing an opportunity for the parties really, directly affected by crime, victims, offenders, and communities. The three of them are different paths that lead to the same place. In this opportunity, we'll have the opportunity to listen to some uh, important uh, representatives of the three movements, rights of nature, ecocide, and restorative justice. We'll have a short presentation of each of them about these concepts. And then we'll engage in an active conversation about how these concepts are similar and different from each other and how can we engage and work together on this. So thank you to everybody for being here. Prairie Lake from Garn, Valerie Cavanes from Garn and, the, and also from the ecocide movement. Jojo Meta from Stop Ecocide Foundation. Eh, Pablo Solon from Fundación Solon, eh, Lawrence Kirchner eh, from the European Forum for Restorative Justice. Eh, and we have, of course, the amazing and beautiful eh, participation of many other leaders eh, of these three movements that will engage in this conversation. And for the, that purpose, eh, before you, any of you guys speak or want to eh, respond to any of the questions, I will eh, like you guys to present, eh, eh, just say your name and say which organization you're representing. Eh, so moving forward, I would like to present Osprey and we would like to hear from you, Osprey, a little bit about eh, what the Rights of Nature movement is and what this concept eh, and approach eh, help us solve and what is this new paradigm that we're proposing. Thanks so much, Nadi. My name's Osprey Oreo Lake, and I'm the executive director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, or WeCan, and I'm also on the executive committee of the Global Alliance for Rights of Nature, or GARN. Um, and I'm really honored to be here today with so many wonderful colleagues to have this really important conversation. Um, I think I'd just like to, to, to acknowledge that we're living in a time in which we really need to change everything about how we're living with Mother Earth and each other. Um, and that's an easy sentence to say, but it's actually the fact. Uh, the urgency of the climate and ecological life-giving natural communities and it's invisible to uh, the way our modern courts work. By maintaining this current structure of law, we are furthering a dangerous human relationship to the natural world of ownership and exploitation. So we have to really ask ourselves, why haven't we stopped these destructive actions that are not only lethal, but also legal under our current laws. We need an entirely different legal configuration that recognizes that the Earth's living systems are not the enslaved property of humans. And an essential step in achieving this is to create a system of jurisprudence that sees and treats nature as a fundamental rights-bearing entity, not merely as property to be exploited. Um, with a rights of nature framework, we're advocating that breaking out of the human-centered limitations of our current legal systems is one of the most transformative and highly leveraged actions that humanity can take to create a healthy and just future for all of us. Um, and as climate disruption and environmental degradation increases globally, it could not be more important to highlight that exploitation and extractivism is a result of patriarchal societies, colonization, racism, and neoliberal capitalism, which are based on the same systems and ideologies of power. It's clear that the global community needs to address these systems of oppression in an intersectional manner to move towards justice and real solutions. And rights of nature can offer a vital path forward in this effort since it is rights-based. It really addresses injustices. Uh, what we are 
seeing in our collective work globally is that people's movements are rising to say no to the commodification and financialization of Mother Earth or the sky. We want to move out of these um, financial systems. Our Earth and our atmosphere are not for sale. We don't want our sacred Earth, water, air, and forest in the marketplace. We don't want to see carbon offset programs. These are false solutions to the climate crisis. And instead, we want to see pollution stopped at the source and for governments, corporate actors, and all of us to live with respect and reciprocity with Mother Earth. And for this, Rights of Nature legal framework can really be quite transformative. Um, and just to give some practical examples, um, at the national level in 2008, Ecuador became the first country in the world to recognize Rights of Nature in its constitution, local rights of nature ordinances in the United States are protecting communities from harmful practices such as shale gas drilling and fracking. Um, the Ponca Nation has made history as the first tribe in the US to recognize rights of nature and law to protect their territory from fossil fuel extraction. Uh, the New Zealand parliament has recognized the legal standing of the Amazon River ecosystem. And these are just some of the uh, really inspiring examples that we're seeing. And of course, there's lots more work to do. But I think, in essence, um, this rights based approach of change is vital to this overall framing of, of how we need new legal systems that not only change um, how we approach uh, nature in uh, and I will I will let Jojo after me explain the, the campaign but I just want to explain you the the aim really of of the the idea of recognizing a crime against Mother Hers. Uh, ecocide means um, in Greek oikos the house and in Latin uh, sidere kill to kill home to kill our home this common hers. And this crime of ecocide is discussed since uh, decades and decades. But what we can notice today is that since the rise of multinationals companies, corporate law and the rules of global trade have tended to prevail over human rights and disregard ecosystem. And it's jeopardizing the lives of generations to come, human beings and non-human beings. And based on scientific findings, we must have the courage to question really necessary today to reaffirm the supremacy of human rights over trade law, but also to recognize that our fundamental human rights as human beings are dependent on our compliance and difference uh, with higher standards defined by bio biological laws and in fact by the rights of nature. We are part of nature, we are one of the elements of nature, and we do need today to recognize that we are interdependent and intertwined uh, to all the other ecosystems and, and spaces on, on, uh, on Earth. If the conditions of life on Earth are disappearing, are threatened, how can we hope to ensure humanity's right to water, to food, to habitat, to health? This is not possible. And the problem is that yet no decision maker can be held accountable for destroying the conditions of life on the planet. And this should be seen as an international crime. What does it mean, international crime? It means that it has to be recognized as the fifth crimes against peace uh, and security and human security, the ones who are already uh, recognized by the International Criminal Court, uh, which you know we all agreed as uh, human community on hers that really is not be acceptable. And at the ones who are recognized are the crimes against humanity, the war crimes, the crime of genocide, the crimes of aggression, but something is missing. And it's missing because law has been written by white people, by Western people, by colonizers, and, and they have a very anthropocentric way to, to, to write laws and, and decide about public policies. They, they do believe so we definitely need more coordination among these uh, beautiful movements and amazing movements that are achieving so much. So Jojo, if you can uh, tell us a bit more about the ecocide movement and the ecocide, uh, and ecocide campaign, that would be amazing. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. And it's a real honor to be in this company, I have to say, with the phenomenal um, names and faces that I'm seeing on this uh, on this webinar. So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and yes, I think the for us um, and in the Stop Ecocide movement, um, we see criminalizing ecocide as a kind of a a very, very specific and very sort of strategic intervention, because we completely agree with um, what Osprey and Valerie have said in terms of the need to shift the mindset um, that has evolved in the dominating Western paradigm over centuries, really, you know, this is this is somewhere we've arrived at through um, a kind of philosophical history that goes right back to Plato, it goes through the Catholic Church, it goes through the Enlightenment, there's this constant separation between spirit and body, between intellect and nature, and, you know, so there's this constant division, and, and in a sense, what we're living out is the logical conclusion of that um, and you, we absolutely need to shift from this this perspective that is harming nature to one that is in, just as in human rights your basic right is the right to life um, that right however is um, is upheld life and so in a similar way we believe that having environmental criminal laws um, actually creates the complement and the protection for the rights of nature and for the security of, of ecosystems. And city to be this, you know, very kind of uh, precise and uh, strategic intervention. Um, and it's one that has previously been seen as perhaps quite extreme. And, and as many of you will know, it make the Rome statute was signed into existence in 1998, even though that originally there had been a clause in that drafting that should have, have put serious. It's very much about the restoration level at the international level of an atrocity crime alongside uh, genocide, alongside war crimes and crimes against humanity has, among other things, it has the uh, potential to start to shift that mindset. So we see it as a kind of almost a little bridging piece. We don't by any means think that criminalizing ecocide is suddenly going to fix everything um, that we all would like to see uh, serious environmental crime tend to be transnational corporations and their supply chains. It makes sense to uh, aim for a, a, a new rule, a new law that can be consistent across uh, different jurisdictions. And that is a possibility, obviously, that is offered uniquely by the ICC. Um, and so that's that's a very important aspect. Um, another important aspect is, is the political one, um, because what we're finding, and I, I think um, Valerie would probably agree with me, and I think it'd be interesting it, shortly to hear from uh, Pablo Solon about the situation in Bolivia, but it is quite... Um, um, and we would, of course, completely support any country that that it intended to do that and, and, and any movement that intended to support that for this is that at the national level, it's quite scary for a government to move in this direction on its own. There's a feeling of perhaps being out on a limb or risking, you know, embedded economic relationships, whereas the support at the international level comes more easily, as we can see again in France, um, the government is happy to say that it supports it at the international level, but is tying itself in knots about how to create the right definition and the right you know, um, implementation for what it wants to call ecocide in France. So this is an interesting situation and it shows that supporting so from a political perspective support we would also say that ultimately um this you know this is a situation that we're all in globally together it's not like we can point at another country or a particular operator and say well you know the leak is at your end of the boat it, it just doesn't make sense and so sense being to this arena and there's going to be everyone's going to sort of move together once this happens um and that is also ultimately the most practical thing in terms of uh, probably no our uh, foundation has convened uh, an a panel of international criminal lawyers and environmental lawyers um, for the first time this has happened actually at the pest at, at the a sort of political request of uh, MPs in this case parliamentarians from the governing parties in Sweden um, who approached us and and said you know you're obviously you, this is your area of expertise can you can you convene can you commission you know uh, um, 
the, the, the creation of a definition that could actually be considered by states to propose at the ICC. Um, and on the basis of that, we were able to pull together some exceptional legal talent to do this. And that conversation in June of this year um, with the idea to then be, for, for states to then be able to review that and consider, although international criminal law for anyone and everyone to be talking about ecocide and engaging in that conversation because that is actually very obviously pushing the political dial. So I'll leave that there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jojo. And that is very interesting because as you were talking about this like massive uh, dangers to the nature like open pit mining and oil spills, we do use the term ecocide and that uh, makes people understand quite easily why of course those are rights of nature violations. So thank you for that and we'll continue with the dialogue. Uh, I want to introduce Pablo. Uh, Pablo Solon, uh, we would love to hear, uh, I know that Bolivia is pushing to an encounter with Pachamama, why ecocide, uh, you guys have a rights of nature uh, law and the declaration as a law, so what did, what did, uh, why did Bolivia uh, promote to everything in first place, second at national level, third at international level, and fourth, it has to be linked to the rights of nature movement. Um, why did we got involved in the issue of ecocide? Because we live ecocide every year. Every year we know ecocide will start in July. It will be terrible in August because we are going to lose hundreds of thousands of forests of the Amazon and of Chiquitania. And this is happening. This has always happened, but now the figures are rising in, in an unprecedented way. In 2019, 400,000 hectares of forests were burned. So you can imagine what that is. So our campaign didn't start because we think on the law, it starts because of the reality. And I think this is the strong thing. We have to have concrete cases all over the world and to fight to stop them. Maybe we can stop some of them through laws, through a change in the inter, inter, uh, ICC. But the, the main thing is ecocide is happening and we have to do whatever we, we can to, to prevent it. And so now I think one of the most important things in the Amazon assembly, in the global Amazon assembly, there is an agreement that the entire Amazon is being threatened by ecocide. Of course, we think what is that we can do in order to stop this from happening. In the case of Bolivia, we have a, 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 a criminal code that is very old, doesn't have very good uh, developed environmental crimes. Uh, our environmental crimes are spread in many different laws. So we decided, okay, let's begin to put everything together and let's put the, the, the crime of crimes to the environment at the top and to be the first one to be recognized in order to order, to organize and, and put order to everything. And that is to recognize ecocide. But here we have a slightly, I, I don't know, a different approach. For us, the most important thing is not that it's a crime, it's to prevent ecocide. So the mechanisms that we are pushing forward are mainly how do we prevent that ecocide from happening? because we had a very interesting discussion. If we want to go through the legal penal code and process, in the case of Bolivia, that means at least in the best scenario, five years before you can have a sentence against someone that has committed a crime, an environmental crime. By then, this will be over. So we need to develop in a way, mechanism then establish precautionary measures that allow us in, 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 the, the, in penal courts. And for us, this is key. Uh, it's more important than the other one. Of course, we will put the, 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 the we want to have ecocide as a crime, but this is key. Um, and, and, and this is uh, one of the key issues that we are moving. And this is why it's difficult because different sectors realize that what we're going to do with an ecocide law like this is to 
prevent. So before you do, you have the ecocide, we can say this activity, this project can commit ecocide. And therefore we want to establish this kind of measures. And this is the most important thing. Well, I go very fast. At the international level, I fully share what you say in relation, uh, Jojo and, and Valerie, in relation to the ICC. Um, see that Bolivia presents an amendment to the uh, uh, Statue of Rome if we have recognized ecocide in our uh, uh, legal system. Um, it will be more difficult the other way around. And, and there are discussions going on. Uh, from a perspective of the South, it's very interesting to share with you some of the reactions that are the other way around. Is, hey, if we push forward, because we already have initiated the discussion, countries, because the North is not going to be accused of it, are they still uh, anthropocentric or not? How should it be a definition of ecocide from a non-anthropocentric perspective? Because at the end of the day, the, many of the arguments are in relation to us and not in relation to the earth system. And that is why we also are thinking in this process uh, to promote something in between that probably will help move the movement on rights of nature, but also the movement on ecocide, and is to, to, to promote at the UN level an assembly of the earth to look at all these issues from a non-anthropocentric perspective. And we think this is key because the moment you start to see reality from the perspective not of humans, but from the perspective of nature, then several doors open. Well, I'll leave it here and thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo, for, for those kind words. Uh, I mean, identify those people and those people can actually pay for those crimes. But what ends up with nature, what's, hap what's gonna happen with nature, uh, we do want to recognize and to guarantee the rights of nature and we want restorative justice. We want those, that nature to be restored. Uh, so for instance, some other representatives from the uh, European Forum for Re Restorative Justice to talk about this uh, amazing concept as well. And then we can discuss about how these three concepts are. And, and thank you all for objective and an override, overarching intention, which is to address the climate and the uh, ecological crisis and, and to stop and to repair and to prevent uh, further damage. And the question that preoccupies me um, in order to stop repair, stop ecocide and restorative justice have that shared uh, concept and intention, but it seems to me that there are different aspects uh, that come into play. And restorative justice has something to say, which is different, I think, from what you've been saying, because um, and these views are very tentative. Please forgive me if I'm not altogether clear, because this is new territory. Not by a third party determining who's, who has committed a crime or not, but by the individuals engaging voluntarily in um, a dialogue, in a conversation, in a confrontation, maybe, usually is to start with, um, because shareholders are, gonna, are starting to divest from major corporates because they uh, don't endorse the uh, damage that's being done. Um, it might be personal, there might actually be a care in a corporation about the planet and the effect of what they're doing on the planet. Education is of course about awareness raising and making people understand as far as uh, a harmer is concerned, the risk or the reality of being sued civilly um, which, of course, gives rights of nature and suit, or a criminal prosecution, which is where, again, ecocide has a huge uh, role to play. The idea that you might compel people to change their behaviour through a criminal prosecution. So all of those influences are going to lead people to, hopefully, to dial proceedings that causes people to engage in a voluntary process of dialogue. Um, they say... 
we, we it's sometimes said that mediation takes place in the shadow of the law. And I think restorative justice probably takes place at best. The late and much lamented Polly Higgins vision, uh, restorative justice was integral to the ecocide law. Uh, as you, Jojo, will know I'm, um, far better than I, um, it, it was uh, essential, uh, as she saw it, that before any sentence for a, a crime of Eco's side, there would be an opportunity for a restorative dialogue to take place between the harmer and the harmed, the criminal and the victims, if you like. Who will be at the table, if I may use that phrase? Well, at the mock Eco side trial that took place in 2012, the wider humanity and future generated the harm, um, the chief executive, shareholders, pension fund, director, and so on. So those individuals, it, and that is where, of course, uh, I see the intersection between RJ and uh, uh, rights of nature. So um, I, I, I don't know, that, and as I see it, moving to a different way of thinking about these things, uh, but the one hope that I have is that it seems in uh, harmers, co corporates mostly, but those who cause environmental damage uh, are, are actually not, uh, it's not appropriate to continue to invest in them. So divestment, uh, ESG, environmental, social and government governance issues have become more and more talked about in the financial and corporate world. So... Uh, all of that is the background to where I believe restorative justice can work with these two other uh, initiatives. And I should say that the European Forum has an environmental restorative justice working group of which Eva is chair, Eva is here as well, which is looking at ways that we can integrate uh, with uh, these other initiatives. So Thank you, Lauren, for that. And you have actually started uh, answering my, my first question. So thank you for, for your talk. Uh, I'm just going to uh, give a, a little bit of guidance about how are we going to direct this dialogue that is coming up. We have 35 minutes to engage in a dialogue and we have many representatives of either one of the three uh, movements that we have spoken about today, ecocide, rights of nature and restorative justice. So I will um, I would like for anybody who is willing, who wants to answer to the questions that I'm going to pose in a second, uh, to open their cameras, to uh, to to put either like one of the little uh, blue hands or say stack on the chat, so I will know that you guys want to speak and to present yourselves before you speak, so the public will know. Just to tell you that we are engaging in this dialogue because many people have asked us to promote this dialogue and to understand the differences between each of the movements and how to interact. For example, a community that wants to protect nature and it's in despair of what's happening and it feels the, the urgency and they don't know how and where to do it and which approach they should, they should uh, go and use. And that is why we felt it was so important to engage in this open dialogue because I think we have so many things in common. So actually the first question was, a, and, and that is an open question for all of the participants here uh, today in this uh, Zoom conversation that is being uh, broadcasted is, what are the main differences and similarities bef between these three movements? Lawrence ha has started uh, answering those questions, but also what are the limits? Uh, we see, for example, a question that is coming up from YouTube that says, what does it mean mass destruction? Ecocide, what does it mean mass destruction? Surely killing even one tree is ecocide considering each tree is com a complete ecosystem from a microscopic uh, point of view. And we have had that question come to us many times when we talk about rights of nature. When, when, what's the limit? When do we establish that a, a, there has been a violation to the rights of nature? So we can talk about the similarities and differences between each one of the movements uh, that will be great at, at this point. And I don't know what, who wants to go first. If we have a hand. Um, that I think uh, exemplifies sort of the three, some the the connections um, between uh, the idea that nature is property. Uh, it comes through our commerce clause, which has been exported around the world in the form of trade agreements, um, and lots of other countries have really adopted, you know, these similar uh, notions for um, power. The environment has been relegated to 
um, the the sort of uh, recognizing that nature is power uh, is is property. Um, it falls to organizations like the Environmental Protection Agency to sort of put the limits on what corporations can create those rules that we ask them to enforce. Uh, and um, when we look at um, um, the constitutional amendments, um, recognizing the next day, it wasn't. A rights movement and a civil rights act um, and now, uh, and then part of that enforcement is also something like called, you know, hate, uh, hate crimes. So um, in many ways, I think about the idea of, um, for us, the culture shift is the key piece. Um, looking back at movements for rights, um, it has been the culture that has shifted society enough to accept changes to the law, which then help, um, you know, broaden that, I, the ideas of rights, like the rights of nature movement, than it is uh, a legal strategy. And we often talk about rights of nature as if it's a legal strategy. And it's really a culture shift. That's 90% of the work. Um, that that we're talking about, um, and you know, in the United States, we still, uh, you know, I mean, the news will tell you in our recent administration and <laughs> the forty three that forty four that before that that we, you know, we we haven't achieved uh, by any means the kind of racial justice and restorative justice. Um, if we're looking just at that, uh, you know, at at the move from slavery to restorative justice for um, you know, for black uh, people in the process, uh, you know, we of course first we're recognizing the rights of those human beings, but really, I think uh, one thing that indigenous begin to have that to go. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, for that. It was very illuminating. Uh, Valerie. Um, yeah, I wanted to comment uh, a bit about what was said and answer at the same time the question that one of the listeners um, has asked. Why, uh, since uh, so many years, I try to, to advance both uh, ideas, the fact that we have to recognize the rights of nature and the crime of ecocide, because she's totally right. I mean, if we don't have this uh, cultural shift, more than cultural, I would say even cosmology shift uh, in in the global consciousness about uh, not being at the center of life and and being part of nature and depending on nature um, I can see uh, Pablo was speaking about uh, being realistic and 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 being um, uh, driven by the reality what's going on in the field uh, I can see, I can feel since years and years that I'm trying to, to promote the idea of recognizing ecocide as the political ideas that are existing in law today, uh, the ecological prejudice principle, the due diligence, uh, transgenerational rights, um, uh, the safe operating space are used by, by the international community and the UN. And we had a great discussion with Pablo who really enlightened me five or six years ago. Uh, concepts, uh, when, you, when you dig it a little bit, you realize that it leads us to a definition of ecocide, which at the end will be after all for humans very clearly. And it's very difficult when you start to explain that we are speaking about uh, uh, an earth uh, system approach, which is really the earth at the center. You can see that when you start to speak, even with very advanced uh, legal experts who are really committed to protect nature, that they, they don't know how to deal with it. And, 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 and then they will become very pragmatic, very uh, uh, saying, yeah, so uh, rights on nature at the national level, at the regional level, at the international level, and same for the ecocide. Because we never know, it shows really that 
you never know when the shift will happen. And, and, we, and, and we have to keep on, but we have to keep on at all levels and on all uh, grounds and on, and on all philosophies at, at the same time. But I'm, I'm afraid that uh, it will not go enough fast, uh, fast enough to, 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 to tackle the, I mean, I will speak on my, on, on my behalf, but when I speak about an ecocide, I speak about harming the Earth systems which sustain life on Earth. So the most vital ecosystems and, and, uh, and species uh, who are keeping the balance of life on Earth and keep life on Earth as we know it. That's why when you cut a tree, you cannot speak about ecocide, but when you, when you destroy the Amazon, we are facing one of the worst ecocide on Earth, very clearly. It's what the natural commons, like the, the international uh, waters, the poles, Arctica, Antarctica, the, the atmosphere, the air, the water, the underground water, all that should be recognized as subject of law and be protected by, uh, by a law on ecocide and of course uh, by a law recognizing the rights of all those systems and species and even biochemical systems. Should. So yeah, I just wanted to share that with you because even the planetary boundaries which are very clear to define all those systems and how they are intertwined and how they, they, they protect uh, the balance of life on Earth have been, has been, uh, have been defined by scientists who are anthropocentric. They speak about the safe operating space that we have to keep, but for whom? For humans. So the challenge is great. <laughs> Sorry. I know, Valerie, and thank you for, for your words. Thinking about this next question as you guys speak, and it is that if a country or a community decides to uh, go in, with a air center approach, uh, well, what will you recommend? You know, what type of uh, one of one of these approaches? Are they complementary? Are they redundant? Are they contradictory? What would you recommend to a community that is uh, trying to promote an earth uh, earth approach like the ones we are talking about today? So I have Osprey and Cormac and Pablo and Casey and Ivo. Uh, so Osprey. Thanks so much, and I'll, I'll try to keep my comments really brief. Thank you for everyone's comments. Um, I wanted just to bring up a few things with um, supply chains and the agribusiness coming out of the Global South, uh, the companies, the financial institutions that are enabling this destruction uh, that extend their businesses. So I think we have to, uh, if you will, up our, our game, up our strategy, because I don't think it's really um, an issue of how much uh, the movements and communities want us to live in harmony with nature, but also look at the uh, uh, entities that are causing the harm and how can we interfere legally, culturally, um, and through communication and education with the entities that are insistent on these old paradigms that are causing urgent harms to communities and particularly harming Black, Brown, and Indigenous people in the Global South. Um, the last thing I want to say is an example. I mentioned the Wanganui River. And the reason I think, um, along with many other examples, uh, including the Ponca Nation, I'm really glad Casey Camp Hornick is here, um, is that it really provides a model of governments working with indigenous peoples and also a mind shift. And the mind shift that I find so deeply moving is that as the indigenous people of the Wanganui River, the river is our understanding that, that we are nature, that literally the river is our ancestor, not metaphorically, not poetically, but in actuality. And so I think the Wanganui River is such a beautiful example of government, indigenous peoples, and a paradigm shift in our understanding as human beings. Look at these key points of interventions. Thank you. Thank you, Osprey. And Cormac? Hi, thank you very much for this really interesting dialogue and um, many questions come to mind, which we could spend days discussing, but I'll try and be brief about complementary approaches to it. Um, and I, I think that um, I agree with what really what all the speakers have said, you know, what Jojo has said about the, the power of using a term like ecocide um, and, and get um, at the liability or the responsibility to to individuals and, and, and move through these structures, but that's that's a long discussion. But I just 
really um, wanted to say how heartened I am to hear the degree of agreement, um, big, bigger picture, and I, um, the different strands of the move it together and make it even more powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Cormac. And that is exactly what, what uh, was today. We're going to have more time to keep engaging and open a new dialogue about this. But uh, thank you for, for all of those interventions. We will not, now like to hear from Casey. Casey Kemp. Thank you. Um, just a moment. I'm trying to undo this. I, I'm on my satellite internet so might be so always wonderful to see your beautiful faces and and to listen to your wise words it's really important and uh, so as i sit here today and listen to you all and understand clearly your intentions and hear from my heart the words that you're sharing and the truth in every one of them. I'm also sitting here with a stone in my lap and water that's listening. I'm hearing the wind and the rain outside right now. The cedar and the... If the colors that we're talking about trying to help at this time have a clear understanding of what we're talking, what they call, we are demanding from the cycle of life, you know, understood what they call North America out there in the rest of the world. I'm hearing a sense of understanding that you all have and that you see and talk about. I miss my, as I have with Shannon and I'm not here. Contemporary society's understanding. What, what I see in the United States right now is, is, is important about in terms of 150 years to end the slavery of nature. We have less than 50 years. We have less than five years. We have five minutes today that we've already used. I think that now it's it's more about prayer, spirituality, and action beyond anything that we've done. You know, there was a time not long ago in my mother's generation, earlier in my generation, certainly in my grandparents' generation, where we didn't have the ability to pick up a phone to use the internet. It's so new, so creator somehow these little these little microchips that are made of crystals world across the globe because that's where mother earth needs us right now is to move things that quickly like how the earth is going to move There's information can be called anything you want it to be called but quit worrying about how the intersections happen Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, do something now to make a difference. Do I'd much rather kick back the gift. No idea how profound it is that you are listening to the things that, that you're hearing and then trying to interpret into this contemporary world what it can be what can be done what the next steps are but quit talking say a next step and move on to it you can't continue talking approach and what do we know about legal rights approaches uh, in other fields so are we, are we putting a law that does not mean that rights are also being effectuated and rights very often work in a very selective in a discriminatory way. That's what we know from victimological research, for example. So legal rights approach, yes, I feel very much in favor of it, but I think we have also to think about how it works uh, in reality. My second comment is uh, about uh, the criminalization of uh, ecocide uh, and um, breaches uh, of um, environmental law. 
I thought in the very beginning that um, we, we criminalize, we, we wish to have the crime of ecocides because we think that we can keep people accountable to make people more responsible by that. Well, that is the question. That is an important question, whether criminal law uh, is really helping making people more accountable and responsible. That is exactly the criticism uh, from which restorative justice as a movement has emerged, I think, that that does not work very well through punishment and to criminal law. That there are other approaches and strategies thinkable to make people responsible and to meet the needs of the victims. So criminalization may be a yes, but we have to reflect very carefully about that as well, I think. Then talking about restorative justice, um, you might be interested in restorative justice because you think, okay, it can help to restore. I've heard that by one of you saying, it can restore nature or damages, and that is indeed important, but in restorative justice in general, not only the outcome is important, but can bring people together or representatives from nature. Make a dialogue. So to really, um, to really valorize their citizenship and their responsibilities, that is as an important democratic value on its own as well. Pablo mentioned, I see it also still in another way, not only from the local to the inter international or supranational level, but I think we also need, when we think about criminalization, hmm, we also need to think about what place does it have in a broader concept, in a broader framework of regulations. So we need an effect and impact from non-criminal approaches, I think. For me as well, I think restorative justice is about the restorative justice as well. And the interesting and positive thing of our cooperation now with you is I think that by reflecting about the applicability and the relevance of restorative justice for environmental cases and harm, we will, we will be obliged, I think, to also adapt and- Olivia, that is irreversible. There's been no natural restoration ecocide. And we, for us, to use the, the we, we discussed, to use the terms of planetary boundaries for a country like Bolivia, and I think for any small country, it's very complicated. Because of course, we will never do something that affects planetary boundaries. We're too small. So we have to have, that's why I say a definition that is based on size, but also based on reality and what we want to do. The third thing is, I think we should, I support the idea and we're going to try to push so that Bolivia presents an amendment to the international, um, to the Statute of Rome. So don't, don't, don't say, I'm not saying this because I don't agree with that, but I think that is not enough. We can also promote and if we manage to pass a resolution in the General Assembly, like we managed to pass a resolution on the human right to water, a resolution to prevent ecocide, what? Why not? It's more easy. So we have to combine because the urgency is very big. And the last thing, I think we need to, to have an approach that, that uh, and I think they are happening, but it's only coming from a different perspective. But we have to bring everybody together, movements that are happening in the ground. Well, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo, for that last aim. We're never going to be able to really happy that this got all of us moving and uh, excited. And I see that there's an exciting uh, conversation also happening in the chat. And I see that this talk, but also what Casey was saying, we need to also stop talking and start acting. Uh, so I really encourage like many more actions, not only of these sort of dialogues, but a, a concrete actions that we can do all together to promote this earth a, earth approaches, these earth system approaches that are so needed and so urgent. I think that the sense of urgency came out through like 